Hi, everyone. Welcome back to a new episode of Dare to be Fearless. I took, I think, last week and perhaps the week before that off of the podcast as I got back to London after speaking at Harvard. If you came to the Harvard talk, thank you for coming. It was honestly a career highlight. I met some remarkable people, not only students, but also people that I spoke next to. I did a keynote in the morning, and then I did a panel with two people that I want to shout out that you guys should absolutely connect with on social media. One was Binta Brown. She's a partner at Minot, which represents some massive people who are in the talent and media world. And then Angelina Lawton. She is the founder of a really big sports agency called Sports Digita. And during the panel, we really spoke a lot about how to be resilient in business, how to reach out and get in front of the right people, along with a lot to do about finances. I didn't realize actually prior to this panel how much of an opportunity there is in sports. So if you're watching this and you're like, I don't know what to do for a living, then certainly not only connect with them on social media, but I think that looking into that industry, people who are leaders in it, potentially coming up with your own job role could be really beneficial. So before I introduce today's guest, make sure to follow Dare to be Fearless on social media, which is at dare and the number two, be fearless, as well as my personal social media, which is Alexa underscore Curtis. And if you guys want to get any Chief Swag mic covers, we sell them everywhere now, officially on Amazon. The official website for Chief Swag is chiefswagofficer.com, as well as TikTok, Instagram shop, and everywhere. So a few months ago, I had on Oliver, and he started an agency called Flight Story with Stephen Bartlett. Uh, and he's now left that agency since he came on the episode. But he posted something, I think on Instagram or LinkedIn, with who I have now today. And I went through everything Sam had done and was like, wow, this guy is so cool. And then I messaged you, but you were traveling for a while. And I finally got to connect with him. And he was just not only so cool, but immediately upon when I met him, I felt like I could connect to him on this level that I can't necessarily connect with everyone who's an entrepreneur. Because I think there's different types of entrepreneurs. Some act a little bit more manic, some act a little bit more chill. And I felt like we were really on the same vibe of just operating on <laughs> that higher frequency. So I'm welcoming today Sam Budd. He is the founder and CEO of Buddy Media Group. He has worked with some massive brands. And I want to talk specifically to him, I think, about how to overcome a lot of the building blocks that people go through in childhood and becoming resilient to do what you've done with your life. So thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, <clears throat> I was giggling actually. We definitely align on the high energy uh, and positive vibes. So yeah, it was uh, it was a pleasure to be invited on. And I don't want to use the word like manic because that can obviously <clears throat> if you're if you have a mental health disorder and you experience mania, it's different. But I think that sometimes I do find I operate in that state when I have really high highs and really low lows with business. And so I think I can relate to people who can have that same vibe. And so I just find that interesting because I think there's different types of entrepreneurs. But yeah, yeah. Well, well, I think also when you're around energizes right if you're extroverted and you're an energizer and you meet another one you actually get energy from someone so a lot of people feel drained at times particularly if they're introverted from too much social interactive or interaction whereas I'm like it's almost like a Duracell bunny that gets supercharged when I'm around people like you uh so yeah now I'm excited about today but when you're alone then do you like to just zen out or you still operate in that way no, I actually really struggle to be okay. on my own. It's like a running joke. Really? Yeah, so if I'm like, you know, if I'm away, you know, abroad or whatever, and I'm working and I'm in a hotel or something, I will just be manically trying to figure out who who I can meet or connect mm -hmm. with, or I'll even go downstairs and, um, you know, make friends or, or interact just because that's kind of A, a strength, and, and B, part of, you know, kind of part of my childhood in terms of kind of always feeling like I need to, to connect, so... Yeah, there's some interesting stuff around around that which we can talk about. I didn't know when I met you how <clears> traumatic <throat> your childhood was. I mean, you've gone through so much before getting to the place you're at now. So growing up, did you expect to become an entrepreneur? Were you on this path? No. Well, I mean, Jesus, I suppose, 
you know, when I look back, you, you know, you can almost look at these stages like in retrospect and, and think, oh, actually there's, there's key moments. But, <clears throat> you know, I think my childhood, you know, it was traumatic. It was also brilliant in so many ways. And, and I, you know, I deeply believe that it's kind of made me who I am, particularly you talked about resilience, you know, at Harvard. Um, and like, I think resilience is, is built through hard lessons in life and, and kind of having to fight for things, you know, to really make them happen. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, as a child, you know, cutting straight into it, I suppose it, you know, it was difficult. I was born into uh, a really, really difficult situation. My dad was a heroin addict. Um, you know, he, he actually used to be, um, on the Olympic swimming team, um, got polio, um, ended up going to Paralympic swimming team, um, but got bullied at school, ended up taking or being given morphine to, to deal with that. And then unfortunately he ended up becoming a heroin addict off the back of it. <clears throat> um, and my mum was drugs and alcohol counselor. Um, you know, the classic trying to help met dad through, you know, rehabilitation process. Um, they fell in love. They had me. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, you know, my early, my early days as a kid was, you know, being surrounded by needles and other heroin addicts and, and, you know, a very kind of chaotic and hectic, uh, environment. And I think that, that manicness, that, need to always be people like with people part of that is is about the feeling of of kind of not being not having self-worth or not having the kind of level of attention that I suppose I I yearned for I don't know if I needed it but I certainly yearned for it because there was so much focus on trying to keep control of of my dad um and then yeah unfortunately my brother was um my brother went off the rails or half, but I found out he was my half brother, um, eventually, which I'll get to. Um, but he went off the rails and was in and out of prison, ended up doing a stint for five years. The day he came out, he overdosed on heroin, uh, with my dad died, um, in my dad's arms, which was pretty heartbreaking. Um, and yeah, I found out he was my half brother, found out I had like four or five other half brothers and sisters, which was kind of crazy. But, you know, I think I was, 13 at that point so you can think about that age and what you're going through um and then yeah I you know I started to spiral I suppose and you know it sounds unbelievable but unfortunately then you know my mum met another uh, person John who was an ex-heroin addict uh had a very abusive relationship um with his parents um he was then quite emotionally and, you know, he was quite abusive in, in certain ways as well. So I had to kind of deal with that, got moved out of Bristol, which is where I was born, uh, to Cornwall, which I'll get onto because that basically saved, you know, it basically saved my life. <clears throat> and then unfortunately my dad um, ended up getting beaten up in a, you know, in a bit of a, an exchange, something to do with drugs and then died of pneumonia. Uh, when I was about 18 um, and that sent me off the rails again. So just as I kind of started to find my feet and, and get control um, and then um, I had a massive car crash uh, to a point where I couldn't walk. I used to be like top 10 surfer in the, in the UK, like sponsored. It was my life, like living on the beach. Like I have no idea how I've come from surfing, lifeguarding, <laughs> surf instructor, you know, competing surfing to, to where I am now. Yeah. But <clears throat> I had to make a decision. And, and I think one of the biggest things was like, am I going to allow this world to, to fuck me up? Right. Am I going to allow myself to follow in the, the feet of, of my brother, my dad, my stepdad and you know, let my mum down, let myself down and let the people around me or, or actually am I going to start figuring out why I'm reacting the way I am, why I've got these insane outbursts of anger, frustration, energy to the point where I was, I was so overwhelming. You know, I used to get expelled from, I got expelled from free schools growing up, I had to get home taught for six months. You know, when it, when you say manic, like I was about as out of control a child uh, as possible. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I think, I suppose, 
the the moral of it is that everyone can have a sob story and like my big thing that that i have is that like just because of my trauma people might you know might listen to this and think god that's it's really sad or really stressful but that doesn't take away from other people's trauma like that can come from just being told not to play the piano because yeah. it's annoying for someone that loves music that can impact them just as much as the, the stuff i've got and i think everyone's trauma and stresses are you know are as valuable and as significant as someone else's when you look i mean it's it's insane your story is like out of a movie it's like <laughs> listening to you and then trying to grasp how I know you now to think of those situations you went through and over that period of time, do you feel like looking back, you grew up alone? I mean, do you feel like you had people in your corner or were you acting out <clears throat> in a way to kind of get attention? It was like a call for help. Yeah, I mean, look, listen, my mom, you know, Nikki, she, you know, if if you met her, you would immediately know she's my mom, right? Like she's just hilarious, like, the, the, her mannerisms and, and her kind of chaotic but incredibly kind of loving mannerisms are something I'm really proud of and I'm, I think that I've taken that and learned from her but she was super supportive and I think you know this is where you really have to ha have empathy for single parents or people that don't have that support network around them because she had to try and be two parents and like my gran was incredible and, and she was definitely helped bring me up. But, you know, mum was, you, you know, she, she made some, some interesting choices and men. Um, and obviously as I was growing up, I was dealing with my stepdad who was a really bad alcoholic and, you know, it was, it was tough, you know, there were some really dark days and some horrible, horrible days, but the big thing is that when I was in Bristol, I didn't have community. And that was when I was at my peak off the scale. Like, really, I'm heading towards prison at that point. Got arrested by the police, you know, really considered, like, you know, a lot of potential prison time uh, moments. But then when I went to move, like, when I moved to Cornwall, it, like, totally changed because yeah. the difference with Cornwall for me um, is the community aspect of it is that everyone is there to support everyone and you kind of congregate around the beach. And so if you think, I don't know, a typical, you know, sort of nine-year-old boy, which is when I moved to um, Cornwall, you will grow up around nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, you know, maybe up to 15-year-old people. Whereas I was growing up surrounded by people that were 60 years old or people that were 40 because everyone was around the beach. And so you kind of learn their mannerisms, how to engage, how to respect people. You know, there was a lot of respect and a lot of kind of um, principles um, instilled in me in Cornwall. And I think that, you know, I'm biased, but if you meet pretty much anyone from Cornwall, I think you're often see these really deep rooted kind of community values principles that are instilled and I think that comes because you were just educated from gr grown-ups yeah. at a young age to be held account and when you are taking the piss or being naughty or doing things wrong someone's mum will pick you up in the car put you in the car and drive you to your mum's house and at that age you know that is the worst possible thing that you can imagine and so it just stops you in your tracks and helps you align. And I think, you, you know, it, it's a big discussion and a big, you know, kind of talk that, that I talk about with my partner is like, you know, where is the right place to bring up your child? And, you know, if you are going to bring your child up in a city or in an environment where the community isn't as strong, how do you instill that community, those values and those principles into someone's life? Because really, I think that's the only reason why I'm here talking to you as a CEO of a multi-million pound business, these behind bars uh, in Bristol? Well, probably the parents, right? Like, would mm. you say it's the parents that can give you those skills? <clears throat> I think the parents are one part of it. I think it's actually your environment. It's, you know, th th and I think this is what I mean. It's like, you know, think about where you spend your time, the teachers, yeah. right? Like at your school, the teachers, you know, how are they you know, what are their mannerisms? What are the values that they're instilling? The kids, parents, the people that you spend your time with. Because actually, you, you know, you spend a lot of time with your your mum. In my case, my mum didn't really try to avoid my stepdad. Um, but they are going to 
give you their projection of how they believe you should be as a child, like, like as an adult. And a lot of that comes from trauma, from how their parents have taught them to grow up. And I think that's a really powerful way of um, getting support. But I don't think it gives you that triangulation of like different approaches to, to life and mannerisms and communication. Yeah, I've done a lot of work and research over the years <clears throat> to try and understand this victim mentality. And I think that when you grow up in the way that, for example, you did or like I didn't have the same stuff happen, but like on the same level of trauma, it's very hard to not view yourself as a victim. So I'm always so curious, why do certain people go on to do like what you and I have done instead of end up in prison or really fuck up their whole life? I mean, do you think it's something that you're either born with that tenacity or that you kind of grow out of it? I think, I think if you, you, you know, Ross Anderson, who I'll get on to, um, you know, he's a psychologist that I'm working with, uh, both personally and at Buddy. <clears throat> and he talks about the fact that um, if you don't have the information, it's not your fault. But if you do have the information, it is your fault. And the idea is that everything is on you as an individual and you can blame everyone else for the outcomes that you've got. But when you have the tools or the awareness of things that you can do to change and you don't pursue those, that's on you. And so, for example, I had a massive car crash. You, you know, I've got a scar, like lost part of my internal, you, you know, like oh a, it was. I couldn't walk for a month. Like it was bad, you know, hit a wall at 60 miles an hour as a passenger when I was 17 years old. Um nearly very nearly died just to add to my mum's stress levels mm -hmm. at, at that time um but I actually I got I had PTSD from that and I went to CBT to try and figure out how because I couldn't get back in a, yeah. in a car um which is crazy for someone that's quite high risk um <clears throat> but the CBT opened my eyes to that type of support being available and we ended up quickly moving on to why I had anxiety, what was triggering outbursts. And so I was then aware. So I had that information, I was aware, and I decided to lean in and pursue that. And so I've been working, you know, since 17 years old, and I wish I'd done it sooner. I wish I'd done therapy, proper therapy when my brother died, because, you know, at 13 years old, I basically nearly screwed up my entire life um, up until that point. But what CBT therapy, which is cognitive brain therapy, it's, it's essentially looking at, um, you know, I think therapy is really amazing, but it's addressing previous historical moments um, to understand them um, and then trying to, you know, move forward away from them. Where, whereas, and I think that's really powerful, whereas A, because I'm an extrovert and I want to take action at all times, CBT is about giving you frameworks and like strategies for dealing with challenges. Yeah. Um, and so like a perfect example is like, you know, everyone says bad things happen in free, right? Um, Dr. Gabba Mate talks about that is a, a traumatic, um, typically a, a childhood uh, moment where something bad happens and it draws you back to a previous state where it triggers you. And then you allow the next two and three things to happen, whereas actually bad things happen in one. And if you've got coping strategies to deal with that moment when something bad has happened and go, OK, I feel triggered right now. I probably need to go for a walk because I'm going to go into a meeting where whereas if you don't go for that walk, you go into a meeting, you have an argument with your colleague, you kick off with a client, you then have a conflict of some sort that triggers you you go spiraling out, you then go out and I don't know, you go off the rails and you get drunk or you get in a fight or whatever happens, then you're facing losing your job, then you're facing, you know, criminal charges, whatever it is, that's an extreme. But actually that's all come off the back of that one bad thing that you've not addressed at that time. And the idea is that, <clears throat> and the thing that I strongly believe, like again, like people out there, Dr. Gabba Mate, you, you know, like Jordan Peterson, they, they all talk about, you know, frameworks and coping strategies, but I can only give my personal opinion. But my personal opinion is there's too much focus right now in the industry, in the world of dealing with a problem when the problem's happened, 
right? So we're all addressing the fire, like when things are on fire, but we're not thinking about the, the, the moments that we can do to stop that fire starting. Uh, and I think if there's one thing that I want to pursue in my career, and if I can use my platform, Sam Buddy Media, to is to help people get ahead of that, to go, I feel triggered. What are the coping strategies, breath work, all these different things that you can go out and do um, to, to stop that? I've been in therapy for years and CBT is like one of the best. I think that's one of the most <coughs> renowned forms of it for dealing with certain types of trauma. I feel like the techniques that I've gotten from my therapist, if it's the right therapist, have really, I've really been able to make a difference in my life. But you have to also be really ready, right, to deal, to not only like deal with a certain type of trauma, but also to change it. I have friends that are like, I'm going to therapy and it's not working. I mean, your therapist cannot give you the answers. They like yep. guide you in the right direction, but no one can give you the answers <laughs> besides you. So yeah. it's 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 funny when people are like, oh, it's not working or like, what do I expect? It's like, how much do you want to change? That, I mean, that is, it's so accurate, Alexa, because <clears throat> I think the problem with everyone is there's always an excuse. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, for example, I'm doing Stoptober at the moment for the first time in my life. <clears throat> but which means you don't drink. Yeah, not drink. Yeah, not drinking. Like just trying to to reconnect with myself, like restabilize because you know I might look cool, calm, and collected, <laughs> and got all my Gross. shit together. <laughs> You know, it yeah. is definitely the the swan analogy of, of chaos going under. And I think, you know, again, the big the big thing with like um, with coping strategies and, and finding it is it's it's not just done just like going doing stop toe. But that isn't going to solve my destructive tendencies when I'm stressed to go out and get hammered. Right. Mm -hmm. And, look, I'm, you know, I'm going to be completely honest. It's the only way I can be. It's like, what do I do when I'm under pressure? We're dealing with cash flow issues clients are doing in a, you know unacceptable things or dealing with us in, in an inappropriate way i've got family troubles my world personally and professionally is on fire guess what it's very easy to go and escape and get hammered and go and you know send it and just cut loose and, and kind of have that escapism and i think you've got to make that decision because everyone can give you the excuse oh, okay well that's understandable you're stressed but you've got to decide. And so that's why in the last 12 months, I've been working with Ross and Rob Eads, uh, both of them. And again, I'm you know very privileged to be able to, to have that kind of support now. But their number one goal is to actually moderate me, right? Get me back. Um, you know, Oliver, if, you know, if he watches this, who I work with, uh, social chain, my name was Mr. ABC, right? Mr. Always Be Closing. I was just this absolute relentless sales machine traveling all across the world, closing deals, just burning out, burning people out around me. Um, whereas now it's like Mr. ABC, Mr. Always Be Calm, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> not cracked that yet. I'm not going to lie. I've not cracked it. But, but the idea is I'm trying to find a way to moderate myself, but I'm doing that for me. Yeah. And the reason why is because I want to make sure that I can turn up for my team, the people I care about, I love, um, you know, turn up today, be ready to have this chat, like be calm, be hopefully add as much value. If I was manic Sam and I'm yeah. coming in and twitching around, it's you're not going to get the value and we're not going to have success. So, yeah, I think that the summary of it, slightly long winded, is like, no matter how many excuses you make, like I'm going to stop smoking, I'm going to stop drinking, I'm going to moderate, I'm going to stop going to bed early, I'm going to get this done. It's on you. And that is the biggest thing that I've challenged. I've yeah. always made an excuse. All the training, all the podcasts, all the books I've read, for really, you've just got to make a decision and, and lean into it. Someone I admire so much is Andy Dunn. He founded this company called Bonobos. Bonobos? I don't know if you have it in the UK. It's like a very famous men's pants brand and they sold it for him and a co-founder like 330 million. Wow. But he's got this book called Burn Rate and he was diagnosed bipolar, but he wasn't diagnosed while he was building this company. And he talks a lot about like when he would have the highs and the lows. I mean, he would go to drinking or just blacking out. And it's like phenomenal to read the fact that this guy was able to raise such mass amounts of money being hungover and like dealing with all of this. But the thing is, if that's your escape, right? I think it's yeah. very 
common with entrepreneurs, the work hard, <clears throat> play hard, you still have to look at yourself the next day in the mirror. So sure, maybe it takes it away for that night or that day, but you're still the same person the next day. Yeah. And and I, I mean, again, it's like, another, I was just smiling to myself, like, <clears throat> particularly the social chain days, because we just exploded, right? You, you know, we went from 28 people. Um, you, you know, when I first worked with Steve and Dom, they were on a laptop in Thailand. And I did a Spotify campaign with them at another agency, um, you, you know, to three years later, I'm the managing director out in the US, we've got 200 plus staff, and we're just flying red eye. And the problem is, you get into a habit where you're like, I can, and, and this is where, you know, you often see it with high, high achieving C-suite individuals with their founders or, you, you know, kind of um, C-suite uh, corporate business uh, leaders is they will, they will almost medicate mm -hmm. to a degree. And so it's like almost, you're almost self-sabotaging to create an excuse. So it's like, I just closed this pitch, you know, I won't say the name, but I closed the pitch with one of the biggest brands in the world. Um, and we'd been out all night, you, you know, and it was like, I compromised mm -hmm. myself. Now, when I reflect on that and it was amazing and it's like, cool, I've ticked the box, but really I think I was doing that so that if it didn't work, I had an excuse. Ah, interesting. Right? And, wow. And, and it's the same thing. Like I did high rocks. Yeah. Um, me right? too. Like, and and this was last year. I did high rocks. I went out the night before. You That's know, fucking insane. It's crazy. And and this is why I say like I'm not. I'm still a work in no, progress. I but I did it because I, I realized I was nervous, and I knew that mm -hmm. if I got through it and delivered it uh, well, great. But if I didn't do it as well, I had an excuse. And so what I've realized is where's that come from? Self worth. Right. I've got really low self worth in terms of my own personal. I wake up every day you're not good enough, you're not achieving. Still. Yeah, like I'll be completely honest, I worked till half two in the morning uh, last night and I was up at six, right? Like, And like that, I feel great, I'm not drinking, I'm very motivated at the moment, we're flying as a business. And But actually the reason I work so late is because I was like, I didn't get enough done in the day, I wanted to do this podcast, so then I had to factor in more time. Um, and actually I had a check-in with myself in the morning to go, hold on, that's old Sam sabotage mentality. How am I gonna actually, that's not sustainable. How do you turn up? You can be like, you've just, and this is what I mean about noticing these moments. I think as a CEO and founder or anyone that really wants to live, like you work so hard, like you're always on the phone, you're always hustling, but you do have to make sure that you have a bit of, grounding time yeah. to make sure that when you get on an important call or even just for yourself personally and mentally if you're not giving you that time if you're not going to third space having a gym getting in the sauna and reflecting you realistically particularly sleep like when you Huge. haven't got a good amount of sleep you're just not going to deliver in the same way no people who say that they can exist on four hours of sleep i just don't believe it scientifically i just don't think you can operate on four hours of sleep to your to your max potential. You can maybe yeah. operate, but you're never gonna feel as good as you would feel after eight hours, right? Yeah, and and I mean, social chain. Steve and I, you, we used to sleep in the office. You know, we'd go to the gym at two o'clock in the morning, like after finishing work. Like I have never known a work ethic and like a kind of resilience and commitment to success that social chain has had. Um, and I had to be very careful when I came in to Buddy because I'm really proud of the mentality that I, I had it anyway. And I think that's why, you know, I was made managing director and, and we had a very successful journey to, to most parts. But like, we were all breaking, all of us. And, and I think, you know, Steve, you know, Steve talks about it in his book. He talks about having to make massive life changes. Um, and I had to make massive life changes as well because it is just not sustainable or it is, but you need to compromise your health like physically, mentally, your relationships, you know, both from a love perspective or your partner, but also your friends, your family, the people that you want to connect with. Because whilst you need to sacrifice, particularly in the early stages, you've got to decide what is important and like long term, you know, and, and we can kind of go on to this, I was talking about the icky guy, but it's like, what is your purpose? And like, what is it that 
when you're on your deathbed, no one gives a crap about the awards you've won. No one gives a crap about how much money you've got squirreled away, you know, or, or the yachts that you've got. They care about memories. They care about your family members. You care about how much value you've added to other people. Because I think really, for me, and why I'm really excited about doing podcasts like this and prioritizing it is like, if this affects positively 10 people, I've added value yeah. and there's something greater than just running a, a really successful agency. Do you look back on the days then when <clears throat> you were working? Social change, that's the name of it, right? Yeah. Were you, I mean, is it? are you type A? Are you a workaholic? I mean, how do you classify that? Because I'm assuming you're probably the same way now. You just have better ways to implement the balance. <sighs> do I? Um, I, I think I think – a, I was a direct, I was an equity shareholder, right? So it was, it, in my head, it, you know, I live with Steve and Dom. We were building that business together. Like, you know, another thing like ADHD, which we'll get onto, but like, you know, dyslexia and ADHD, but like huge parts of that are like justice, loyalty, um, and just generally, again, like this whole thing that I've grown up with because of being let down by so many people, I never want to let anyone down. Um, and I'm fiercely loyal um, to a lot of the times my detriment. Um, and so I think I always have been a workaholic because self-worth, I need to prove myself, you know. And, and like another thing that's hilarious about achieving success is I remember saying to myself, you know, make my first million and like, you know, I'll be happy. And like. I, I was like talking about hitting 5 million. Like, do you know what I mean? You're immediately looking at 5 million. Now I'm like, right, cool. When we get to 10 million. Yeah, there's two different types of founders. And I think there's probably the one who's like, cool, I'm chill. And then there's the you <clears> who's just that naturally ambitious. But some of it is probably self-sabotage, right? Because like, are you ever really happy? Just, is that even relative? Well, that will, you, you know, the happiness things is difficult, right? Like, you know, we were talking before this about, you, you know, this whole thing between like, um, like Jeff, Bezos uh, talks about like work-life balance. It doesn't exist, but like he supports work-life harmony. And the idea is it's like, if you find a career that you love, that you can deliver purpose or value that, that makes you happy and makes other people around you or can connect you with a passion, like you're gonna lean into that. You are gonna work longer than eight hour days you're going to be doing 12 14 hour days 60 80 hour weeks like at times 100 if you really want to if you're going to be really honest with yourself like 100 hour weeks like are not uncommon when you're launching a business because you have to lean in which means the weekends it means evenings it means early mornings it doesn't mean that that's healthy and i'm not supporting that i'm just being honest around buddy wouldn't be where it is you know i've taken no investment so this is just homegrown um with some amazing support around me, of course. But if you if you don't kind of have that balance of like work, like understanding of work life harmony, I think you'll you'll always have like a you'll always have a divide between like living your life with your family and your friends and then having your work life and it won't it it, it won't work. I don't know, you must you must have that experience. Like you're so driven, your business is flying what we're doing now is a passion, but it's also part of your your job. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's quite interesting because I feel like when you're when you're going through the motions, and I'm really interested about what you say about self sabotage because I don't think a lot of founders hone in on that enough, and I think that that work life balance that work hard, play hard <clears throat> mentality. I always believed in that so deeply. And I mean, I still do, but I used to kind of do the same thing. Like to me, celebrating something big happen would be like going to a dinner or getting drunk or doing something that like, to me, I felt like I could do this because I had succeeded in some way when in reality, there's so many other ways to do it. Like going to a dinner and sure, going out with your friends, but you don't need to drink a ton to like celebrate. And that's not a matter of leaning into this like whole sober curious culture. It's more like, why is that such a common way that people feel like they should celebrate when it comes to business? I think it's just because it's so hard to exist and run a business and just sometimes the escape is like alcohol mm. that's the drug yeah so it is a really good point i mean you know we like our first like me was you know a gym session followed by lunch right and like it was this really positive energized healthy 
uh, moment. And and the reason why I suggested that was, um, you, you know, actually I'd previously done it um, with, with another uh, contact of mine. And it was like the most incredibly positive thing that allows you to connect and kind of leave it all on the floor in terms of the gyms. You ha- kind of have gained this like unique yeah. respect. Um, but I think, I think the self-sabotage thing, I mean, let's face it, it's not just alcohol. I think, I think this is the, there's two, I'm quite passionate about this, obviously because of my childhood and like having to deal with it and also coping with it myself, but like drugs and alcohol and sugar and vaping and all of these things that you do to, um, to compromise yourself mentally, physically, in my personal opinion, they are all plasters behind a deeper trauma, right? And I think I genuinely believe that as a child, you grow up with a perception or a learned perception of who you are, whether you're worthy. Um, you know, it's that, that whole analogy of, um, I've got to get this right, but, you, you know, a, a lower class and a higher class um, child is taken to the dentist mm-hmm. have you heard this one no and um the lower class parent um says look when you get in to uh the dentist remember you know if it hurts just stay still you know don't cry don't do anything just just listen to them right just just listen to that person in the higher class um person more educated more experienced who says look if you've got any questions you get you make sure you ask them you make it, you know, they work for you. We're paying for that time. And this mentality of like, that's, but that's two people at the same age being given different messages about how to grow up. Um, And I think when, and the reason I'm saying that is because I got brought up to not feel worthy. I didn't have the attention or the support. I was also ADHD and out of control. Um, I didn't know I had ADHD until I was 20. Um, which is something we can go on to. But I was also then so chaotic that I was overwhelming to other people. So then what happens when I go to see my friends or I go and see my cousins, my family, they are unconsciously or consciously removing me or separating me or putting me in a box to say, well, Sam's out of control. Mm -hmm. Sam's the troublemaker. Sam's mischief is, you know, I don't want my kids hanging around. You know, I was never a bad kid in terms of like, I always got on and, but, but I was always getting into trouble. I was always energized. I was so constantly in need of stimulation and hitting my endorphins that when people removed me from it or, subtly put me down it created this self-worth issue with me so then I bring that up to an adult so then what happens when my business is failing we're potentially going bankrupt in the pandemic or you know the tech recession when that happened and four of our biggest clients just pulled like Farfetch for example lost 90% value in shares you know we're doing 150 grand a month or whatever it was with them like you think about that impact as a small business owner well, hold on, we're going to lose the house because the mortgage. I'm going to look like a failure because we're going to lose the business. People think I'm rubbish because we haven't got enough clients. The team are stressed. All of a sudden, it triggers my self-worth of not being good enough. And then my immediate go-to is the bucket's filled. I'm going to go out and absolutely deploy and send it, make my life 10 times worse. And I think, I know this is quite a long-winded way of explaining, but the more that you can look into the triggers that you've had from a child and actually recognize them, address them, understand them, the greater the chance of being able to deal with self-sabotage as you get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, No, you're, you're very right. And I mean, there's so much in there and I love that you bring in the mental health aspect, which I want to get into at Buddy, because there's so many founders who lead with the, again, that you should all be working and working so much and they don't think about the employees and what it's like for anyone, especially at a startup. Um, but I do want to say one thing, and I'm going to look at the camera to say this before we get into it, because I think this you brought up such a good point and specifically about 
culture and I think being an entrepreneur. I It was in April and I said for the first time, I think yesterday on my Instagram, that I, I did get sued over the past year. And then I got canceled in April and I my mom came to London and I just, I thought I was losing my mind. I mean, I was in what I would consider hell and I had never experienced this form of hell before and it went on for months. And I went to Malta, which is super strange, like with my mom for a trip. And I was just acting, I think, near psychotic. I was so angry and and so mad at just everyone. I couldn't have a conversation with my mom. I was like high and low and crying. And like rightfully so. I was 27. I was getting sued. The internet went psychotic over something that was a mistake. I thought my life was over. And my mom looked at me and she said to me, and she's like British and 75. And she said, what the fuck is wrong with you? You go to therapy, you meditate, you work out, yet you're acting like this. And she said, whatever you're doing isn't working. And I, over the past months, I've looked back and I thought like, wow, she's so right. Because it's great to meditate and have a routine and work up. And I was religious and I am routined with that routine. However, that doesn't mean you're living. You can do all of that, but like, does that make you really happy or are you doing those things because you think that's keeping you sane? And I look back and I think, I think that was me thinking it was keeping me sane and grounded. But in reality, what I really wasn't doing is was just living, was like waking up some days and just going for a walk, skipping the meditation, like skipping the workout, just having my mind be free. And I think people, when they're in business, it's so hard to just exist. But sometimes you just need to like exist. It doesn't mean meditating or going on a run. That doesn't make you healthy all the time, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, obviously hearing it again, you you know, that is, you know how bad it can be when the press turns on on anyone. I I remember we we just did a campaign with Joe Wicks, Move with uh, with Aviva. And um he talked about how his ADHD was triggered by uh, fast food, right? Um, and I've never seen such an attack on one individual, like to the point where if someone wasn't really strong yeah. and as you've you've dealt with, like you, you genuinely would, would be concerned for their own mental health. And, and we've seen it, you know, like we, we've literally seen it in the press recently. Um, so I, I would say... I would say like what's really interesting around this is like firstly that's tough love from your mum <clears throat> and she's there to support you but also it's like sometimes you just need to be given that time um and and that support um to to kind of get over it but the big thing that I smiled at is that I've had times where I've been so resentful and so angry you know to the point where it corrupts who I am, yeah. my happens, my soul. And I think there's a huge, um, you know, there's a, a huge issue with, with stuff like that, where you're not, you're not being mindful. By the way, my phone's going off It's there. It's either one of us, but it's fine. Is it? I can't hear it on the microphone. Can I not? Um, should we, we go? Yeah. Is it yours? I think it might be mine. <laughs> I know. There we go. <laughs> I'll edit it out. Edit, edit. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, classic okay, social social media mindful. so um so you we were just talking about that yeah. moment with your mum so so i think like essentially what's really interesting about that whole situation that that you went through um first of all it's like heartbreaking um to hear because i know what it's like um you know we had a real issue um that we had to deal with actually recently with joe wicks where we were doing a campaign with him and he came out and talked about how, um, you know, he felt his ADHD had been triggered by um, processed foods, right? And the media attacked him. And it's like, you just feel like you want to crawl up and, and hide, right? And you feel like everyone's out to get you. And it's very difficult to to find a way to, to, to kind of come through with that. The big thing that I found is that in those moments, resentment can manifest like to a point where it is so toxic yeah. that it corrupts you as a person. <clears throat> and I've had it where I've just found myself talking in a way that I would never, ever want to to talk. And, and you know, there was there was a moment or there's been moments in my life where, where I've particularly had to, to, you know, check myself on that. But I would say you've got to decide, do you have the time? Is there enough time on this planet 
for you to be spending negative, toxic, resentful, attacking someone else in defense of your own insecurities? Or is it more important to sit down, check on yourself, go, that fucking hurt, yeah. that was horrendous. How do I move forward? And what are the things that I can do? And how do I make peace? The big thing for me, like, you know, that ironically, the thing I haven't said is that, you know, in, when I was at social chain, my stepdad then died um, of, of uh, basically liver failure from alcohol. And I hated him so much during those years. I found it so difficult to deal with him. And the resentment was there, but I had to just let it go. I had to allow that to go so that I wasn't creating this narrative. For example, I could say how bad he was, but actually he was just a broken child that didn't get the support that he needed and he tried his best and actually he's not with us anymore but there were good times that he added uh, and and bad times but actually that doesn't dictate how I move my life forward and and I think going back to your kind of earlier question around how I'm imp like implementing that into work I've really noticed there was a stat um you know, the NHS released uh, this statistic to say that there's been a 68, I think it's a 68% increase in 12 to 19 year olds being um, submitted in for urgent mm. mental health issues, right? In hospitals, yeah. 68%, right? That is our next generation and is estimated to continue, right? So we've got an issue where healthcare services are at capacity. We have had a next level spike in more cases of our next generation. And I am seeing that impacting now, both on parents within my business, dealing with children that are having challenges or partners where they're genuinely having mental health, issue, mental health issues. But I'm also seeing it with the people struggling to deal with the stresses of life, coping strategies, not looking after themselves. Because of this, a bad thing happens. Yeah, and I actually read a book called The Icky Guy, um, and if you if you haven't read it, I would strongly uh, recommend it. But it basically helped me realign and say, well, look, this business that I've created, so, uh, social chain, but but Buddy Buddy Media, that the whole goal is to do really powerful, purpose led, impactful activations that genuinely change the way people experience life or the way that they can connect with a brand in a really powerful way and to be able to do that I need a team and a company and a culture that genuinely try and have positive impact and supportive culture and embrace key values because you can't live in a marketing world you have to have that in your operations and I always challenge that when a brand comes in say we want to win an you know an award for driving impact of our customers. And I immediately say, what is your operational strategy and your product offering that's going to allow to do that? Because we can go and sell it, but people will see straight through you unless there is a deep rooted operational goal that's going to achieve that. Um, and so with Buddy, I thought, Jesus, I'm selling all this stuff and I'm not implementing it. And actually our culture 18 months ago was a bit toxic. You know, I had the wrong people in. I had... The wrong I hired based on skill, which is important, but not as important as value and cultural fit. Um, and so then toxic people that were high skilled workers were essentially impacting a wider group of people and decreasing the value and decreasing the retention rate of my staff. I felt shit. I was drinking more because I was dealing with negative energy, negative moments, negative clients, because you attract the wrong clients and you create the wrong type of relationships. And so I decided to bring Ross Anderson in, who is basically, um, you know, a, a resilience coach um, and a psychologist that talks all around how you can find purpose, um, how you can improve sleep quality, improve your personal uh, relationships, um, both with the people around you, but also yourself. And the, the funniest thing that happened was he said, the problem is you to start with. So the first thing was just like, you're the problem. Mm -hmm. The CEO is all the, always the problem, right? Because you dictate everything from the top down, right? So if you set the wrong type yeah. of values or tone of voice, you need a team around you and a board to help guide that and make sure you do it right. So we actually went on a journey 
where we started looking at my own personal resilience, the way that I turned up, you know, if if I was stressed or particularly tired, do I block out the morning to make sure when I turn up to the office, I've got energy? I don't know if you've ever had that moment where a leader walks into a room and heads down mm-hmm. and they are just pissed off, furiously typing on their phone or whatever. That will kill and the energy. You call it a leader. Yeah. Yeah. And that kills that the is. energy. Yeah. That percolates through the teams. That then goes to the clients. All hells breaks loose. And and so he's helped me really try and figure out how I can turn up. Uh, and I still get it wrong all the time, but I'm getting better. But then he's working with the team individually. And we just took everyone to Portugal um, on a resilience and well being boot camp all around purpose. Um, there was a lot of resilience, it was certainly a lot of fun. Um, but the ultimate goal from that is, do we actually align with our values? Um, and since I don't think we've, you know, we've got like a 95% retention rate in the last 12 months from keeping staff, because I think we're actually listening to them. You mentioned about finding your purpose or like not knowing what your purpose is something earlier in this episode. Looking back, do you feel like you had to go through everything you went through to quote unquote find your purpose? Because it's this overrated thing. Like, how does a young person find their purpose? You also, fun fact, your cousin started a very big company called Casper. So I feel like entrepreneurship and success is ingrained in your family. There's something about you. You both have started massively successful companies, right? So I think that's really interesting. Another person, Sarah Blakely, who's the founder of Spanx, her brother is also like a wildly successful. I mean, she sold that company for, I think, one or $2 billion. And her brother is this very well-known entrepreneur. So I think there's something about certain families. And I think it's cool that you both, you know, are are related and have this background. But when it, when it <clears throat> comes to finding your purpose, how do you feel like you found it? If you could look at the camera and say, like, this is how to find your purpose, what would you say? Yeah, I think firstly... Buddy Media and Casper are two very different spectrums. Sure, but um, still successful, right? Yeah, definitely successful. But, you know, Target, you know, seeking to acquire Casper for a billion dollars um, and, and Buddy are quite different. But you're right. Like John, his brother, is a founder of Hydrant. Luke's gone on to launch Block Renovations, which is now, you know, half a billion pound business. Like we've got some very entrepreneurial people uh, w- within our family. <clears throat> I think... Um, I'm looking at that one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the the biggest thing for me is that your your purpose comes from being really deeply honest with yourself, um, and taking the time to write down and journal and think about what truly makes you happy. Like I know it's like a a bit of a uh, you know people have said this all the time but it's like what would you do if you weren't paid any money but you could do it every day right and you know for me it's helping people right like I don't feel that I had the help or the support or the the guidance that I needed um, or should have had uh, as a child and I am now in a position or certainly building um you know, building a profile that allows me to help those people. And so every time I do something like this, every time I do the I newspaper talking about my experience with ADHD and I get feedback knowing that people are genuinely positively being impacted, I feel like I'm connecting with with my core soul. Um, and actually you realize that all the deals and all the awards that you do, like, you know, that you get, that's all byproducts of, of actually what true happy, happiness is. So I would say never look too far away from helping others because I think to serve is the greatest honor in life, you know, to serve, to genuinely try and add people, add value to people um, and look at ways that you can do that. And you'll be so surprised at how quickly that kind of support comes back to you. Um, I would say take time to journal. Like I hate trying to get me to journal with someone that's got dyslexia and ADHD is hilarious. But every day, or certainly most days, uh, Ross has taught me to, to, to do three things, which is like, how do I turn up for the people I love, I lead and I inspire. Um, and then at the end of the day, I go, how did I do? Um, and it allows you to stay focused on the present because someone like me, and I think a lot of CEOs and a lot of people that are desperate to achieve self-worth success, you spend your whole goddamn life living in the future. 
and you realize that two, three, four years just fly by and you've actually just not really focused on the journey. And really a lot of success is about really enjoying that journey and being surrounded by people that you respect and care about. I want to wrap up with two questions. One would be how have you survived entrepreneurship while having ADHD? You also said you have dyslexia. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mom, mom's, uh, mom's <laughs> bred a good one. Um, being honest, I think ADHD has really helped me. Um, dyslexia, dyslexia, not so much. And I still exploring the different, the, the different elements of it because dyslexia has superpowers as well. Like I get in trouble for talking about superpowers, but I genuinely believe, you know, 5% of the population in the UK um, are neurodivergent, right? That means that we think, feel and act differently to 95% of the population, right? And I think that allows for me, what, what that has allowed me to do is I'm always thinking, and I've got to be careful about being in the present. I'm thinking two, three years ahead. You know, I, we're, we're doing a, a, a campaign which, you, you know, is involved in the World Cup next year. And I'm already thinking about the second World Cup and how we're integrating that and tying it together in six years time. Like I always see ahead and that allows me to be creative and lead better, right? People that provide a clear vision, clarity as to where we're going, um, that allows you to inspire and lead a team in a better way. And, and so I think my ability to communicate like if you asked me to write down these feelings, I'd be here for three hours mm -hmm. and there'd be a shitload of spelling mistakes, right? But I think ADHD in some ways um, has hindered me. The, the late nights often come from not being able to sit down and focus. I have to do admin work at night um, because I'm not, I can't communicate, I can't call people. I can sit there like that was a lot of the stuff that I was doing last night was... You know, it was payroll, it was month end, admin, VAT, all this stuff that no one kind of talks about when you're winning yeah. awards. Um, and the dyslexia part of it, I think what that's taught me actually is innovative ways to get support on things that I can't do. And the definition of a leader is empowering other people, right, to achieve success for the collective good of that business and I can't write proposals. I can't do, you know, long kind of structured emails or, or plans quickly. I can verbalize it. I can get people and I can guide them on it. But I've almost had to get kind of lazy to some degree mm -hmm. because otherwise it all won't be as efficient. But that's where good founders, they outsource, right? You're not good at that. You don't need to be good at that, yeah. right? So you can find somebody to do it. I'm actually banned. From oh, touching, I'm, ba I'm banned from touching so, proposals. So yeah, word of advice: <laughs> yeah. if you're bad at it or you have ADHD, ADHD, ban yourself from what you're not that good at and find somebody else to do it. Yeah. Uh, and then, so with Buddy, because I never actually directly asked you, but you did mention something about sales, and I can see you being like a fucking monster <clears> when it comes to selling. What exactly does Buddy do? And then, last question on top of that would be like some pieces of advice you have for sales. How do people close deals? What do they do wrong? The short spiel in the best way on how to sell like Sam. Jesus. Let's start though with what exactly <clears throat> is Buddy? Yeah. So, so Buddy Media is a social marketing agency. Um, so, we focus, like, our core thing is trying to bridge the gap between creative and performance. I think. There is a massive challenge right now in the market where creative agencies are amazing at telling stories but can't drive ROI. And media agencies are incredible at driving ROI, but they lack the storytelling that's critical to drive sales. And so I've tried to bring Georgina Bajarski, who's our media director, uh, ex or response media, I've tried to bring a media agency and a creative social agency in together uh, to integrate. Um, and that allows us to tell powerful stories, big high impact moments with typically purpose driven concepts that drive results through paid social and amplification. And sales. Sales. Over the years. I mean, you said at the beginning, you were like doing red eyes, closing these deals. I mean, what's the way? How, do you cold call, cold email? What's the best way to go about this? Say you've got a startup and you don't know how to get in the door. How do you get in the door <clears throat> with cold calling with sales? I would... So I would say if you, you know, number one, if you're going to create an agency, like if you're going to create any business, there is nothing more important than oxygen 
for that business, right? And the way that you can drive maximum oxygen is to lean on your own expertise. You are the business leader. You understand the business more than ever. You hopefully understand the industry more than ever. Otherwise, you've picked a hard challenge. So you should be out there networking, connecting, opening doors, bringing it in. The resource side of it is critical for delivery, but that's something that you can bring support in to do. But if you're not bringing that oxygen in, so I think the number one tip, one of the biggest mistakes we ever made at Social Chain is stop doing new business because we were inundated. We just won a global awards, inundated, and then the pipeline dried up, things changed. And all of a sudden we had this massive headcount in the business and three months of zero sales coming in and loads of clients dropping out. So regardless of tactics on sales, never stop the oxygen coming into the business, never stop connecting marketing and outreaching and engaging, right? Like even things like this opens the doors to either helping you hire people um, to come in and support you to deliver or people listening about some of the work that you've done um, to work. In terms of sales tactics, like I've uh, I've never been asked this question. I always think about how I would deliver it because the reason why is you've got to be careful with like psych psychology mm-hmm. and actually you've got to be careful that it's not a form of I wouldn't say manipulation, but you you have to mirror people, right? You have to understand. You have to connect with them, and I would say that you know, 80% or, or certainly 7, 70% of a moment is through your energy, mm-hmm. your connectivity, eye contact, rapport, the way you're sat. Like, I don't know if you notice, I put my knee up, you put your knee up. Chill. Right? But it's, we're mirroring yeah. each other. Um, oh. Changing your tone of voice, <laughs> right? I've got you there, haven't <laughs> no, I? No, I'm laughing. I've yeah. got you, yeah? <laughs> yeah. But changing your tone of voice, elevating, bringing sure. it down, having dynamic, asking questions. But the big thing... I think cold calling is great and it works. If you want to build a relationship with a big global brand and have positive impact, you need to be connecting with them, Mm -hmm. right? And by connecting, I mean, do you genuinely build rapport with someone to the point where you're adding value to them, right? Number one, best sales strategy, add as much value to that person and focus on how you can improve their life. Because guess what? If you figure out how to elevate someone within their brand, help them achieve their goals, help them get promoted, help them win an award, help them look and feel great, they're going to stick with you. They're going to give you more opportunities because again, life is to serve. And I think so many people, and and it's like How to Win Friends and Influence People, that book, best sales strategy book book ever, even though it's about relationships, rapport building, is focused on how are you presenting an mm-hmm. argument that adds value to their life, but position it a way that by su- supporting you or giving you what you need, you're helping them. That, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think cold calling is great, but I'm a very big believer of there is a core element of process, sales pipeline management, auditing and making sure you're specific and your targeting focus, but there is nothing more important than building relationships adding value, exciting the client, uh, and and ultimately biggest thing is how do they solve their problems? Sam, this was by far, I think, one of my favorite interviews out of 200 plus. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will link everywhere people can find you or connect with you in the show notes, but where can people get in touch with you the easiest? Just, um, yeah, hit our website up. Um, so it's buddymediagroup.com. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you everyone for watching another episode or listening of Dare to be Fearless. Uh, A new episode of the show drops every single Wednesday. And if you are a guest who has an amazing story, in particular, if you happen to be a female founder who's been in business for five plus years, I'm very interested to hear from you. So send us a DM on Instagram or send me an email with your story. And if you do want to try out Chief Swag, you can use the code chiefswag10 at chiefswagofficer.com and get your own custom mic covers. I'll see you back next week for a new episode of Dare to be Fearless. <laughs>